how this really works as far as taste is concerned, they don't really know. Umami gives us uh, more of a taste of salty, and umami typically tastes monosodium glutamate, or what we'd simply call MSG. And MSG is something that we use as a preservative in our foods, and it gives a bit of a salty taste to it. But it's not a typical gustatory or taste receptor. Neither is this fat receptor, but they don't know exactly how to categorize those. So we say that these are your typical tastes, salty, sweet, sour, bitter, okay? And so you're going to be tasting those today. One of the other things that you're going to do in lab and this one's always fun, is you're going to take a piece of towel and you're going to stick it in your mouth and you're going to dry up all the saliva in your mouth. Everybody always loves this one. Yeah. Get all that saliva out of your mouth and when there's no saliva left, stick your tongue out so everybody's going to mm, yeah. all in class so you won't look all that much more dorky than anybody else. And then in this little way boat, there's some sugar. And what you're going to do is take a little bit of the sugar and put it on the tip of your tongue. And with your tongue still sticking out, don't pull it back in your mouth, you're going to time how long does it take before you taste this sugar. Okay? So you're going to see how long it takes. <laughs> now, if you could look at the surface of someone's tongue, we have these pits throughout the tongue. And coming out of these pits, it looks like there's these little hairs sticking up, or maybe it looks a little like cilia, uh, but they're really dendrites that are attached to our gustatory neurons. So that when we eat something and mix it with that saliva, those chemicals from the food go over the surface of the tongue and then fall into these little pits and interact with the dendrites. And those chemicals are the ligands that will bind and open the ligand regulated gates and then we take this information to the temporal lobe of our brain for the taste that we perceive. Now, if food is sweet, uh, we're typically eating things like glucose and fructose, so the sugary stuff. But also some amino acids have a sweet flavor to it, so that's why sometimes certain meats that you eat might taste a little bit sweet. Sour substances usually are acidic, like lemons, of course. Salty has a lot of metal in it, like sodium, potassium, gives us a salty flavor. Bitter would be like caffeine, nicotine. Uh, some medicines give us a bitter flavor, like quinine. And then also poisons are typically bitter in taste. So this would be like strychnine, okay? And uh, it's believed that the bitter is at the back of the throat, most likely because if you do taste something bitter and it happens to be poisonous, it's closer to the gag reflex. Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to get it up faster. Okay. So the next type of testing that we're going to do today is olfaction. And so olfaction has to do with smell. <laughs> receptors are also chemoreceptors. So just like in the mouth, these olfactory receptors respond to chemicals that have dissolved in water. So when we smell something, that smell, those chemicals are going to go up into the nasal passage and then way up here, kind of like between the eyeballs, but back a little further, is where our olfactory receptors are located. So we've got to get the smell all the way up there. That's why if you want to smell something really good, you sniff it in so that you can get all those chemicals way up into the nasal passage. So here is the olfactory region, or what we call the olfactory epithelium, and these are the olfactory neurons. 
they go up through the skull bone and they synapse with the olfactory bulb. Now, I don't know if you remember from anatomy, but when you were looking at the skull, the human skull, I uh, took the skull cap off and looked down into it, and at the front, there were all these little holes that you learned as the olfactory foramina, okay? And that's what these little holes are right up here. These are the olfactory foramina, and our olfactory neurons go through those foramina, thank you, and then synapse with the olfactory bulb. Down here are where we have the dendrites for the olfactory neurons, and they are stuck in a mucus layer. So you know that you have mucus in your nose. And our mucus in our nose is a combination of a protein called mucin plus water. The water is to help to dissolve the chemicals that we smell, and the mucin is to make sure the water doesn't come pouring out our nose all day long. The mucin actually thickens the water up so that it stays up inside the nose in the nasal cavity. Now sometimes we produce way too much mucus. And when we do, it's really hard for the chemicals to get through that layer. And you know, you know when you have a really bad cold, you can't really smell anything because your nose is so stuffed up and the chemicals don't have the ability to dissolve to where the olfactory neurons are located. Now, one of the other things we talked about yesterday about olfactory neurons is they are different from any other neuron in the human body. Olfactory neurons only survive for about 60 days. After 60 days, they die. But in between these olfactory neurons, kind of like in the pink right here, between our yellow neurons, these are stem cells. And these stem cells turn into olfactory neurons. So when these neurons die off, we produce new ones. And these are the only neurons, at least that we know of, that regenerate every 60 days. Now this is really kind of weird because you have new olfactory neurons every 60 days, but the olfactory bulb is as old as you are. And this olfactory bulb takes the information, again, to the temporal lobe so that you can perceive what you smell. So you would think that not only if the olfactory neurons are new and working fresh every 60 days, the rest of the olfactory bulb and everything would be new and fresh, but it's not. And so over time, we lose our sense of smell. Now, everything we taste is actually 80% of what we smell. So again, you know, if you plug your nose, uh, you can't taste things very well. And one of the other things we're doing in lab today is you're going to be doing a taste test, okay? So over here on the side, there are some different types of foods that you're going to cut up for each person in your group. And then you're going to put them into one of these handy dandy little containers. Take it back to your group. And on your tray, you have some toothpicks. And so what you're going to be doing is taking those different types of foods and taking a toothpick and having your partner close their eyes and plug their nose and take one of the foods and put it in their mouth. Now what we're going to do is, with their nose plugged, eyes closed, have them roll the food around in their mouth and try to figure out what the food is. Some people are really good at this because they're real into the texture of food. <laughs> Some people are real texture people, okay? They won't even eat things if it's the wrong texture, okay? If it feels wrong in their mouth, forget it. They're not eating that thing, okay? So this is all about texture. So eyes closed, nose plugged, roll it around your mouth, see if you can figure it out. And then write down for them what they say it is. And then still, nose plugged, eyes closed, have them chew it. Do they think it's something different now? And then unplug the nose. And now do they have a different idea of what the food is? So you're going to write down each of those different things uh, with the nose plugged, with the chewing it, with the nose unplugged. Did they change their mind what the food was? Okay, and I think there's one, two, three, four, five different types of foods over there that you'll be able to uh, taste. Okay, but that has a 
lot to do with texture and of course keeping the nose plugged or not uh, because again that's 80% of what we're tasting. Now one other thing about these olfactory neurons here is that these olfactory neurons again are different in another way than any other neurons. The majority of neurons, except these, in our body can only bind one type of ligand. So maybe it's enkephalin, maybe it's serotonin, that's the only ligand it can bind. But olfactory neurons can be stimulated or turned on by ten different types of ligands. And in the mouth, we only have basically four different types of taste neurons. But in the nose, we have about a thousand different types of smell neurons. So if we have a thousand different types of smell neurons, and each of them can bind ten different chemicals, that means that we have the ability to smell about ten thousand different chemicals, or ten thousand different smells. And our sense of smell isn't nearly as good as a lot of different animals' sense of smell. Now, there are some disorders to smell and taste I want you to know. One is called anosmia. This is the in inability to detect odor. Now, anosmia can be due to a couple different things. Like, for instance, maybe your patient has been exposed to certain chemicals that have just fried the olfactory bulb in the brain or maybe cause damage in the temporal lobe. Sometimes people will have anosmia if they have really, really bad allergies. Because those super bad allergies can cause swelling in the nasal passages, and then the chemicals can't get up into the nose, and they can't smell things. Now sometimes uh, people who are in car accidents, for instance, will have some brain damage, and after the car accident, they have anosmia, and they can't detect odors. And usually, if a person has anosmia, they also have agesia, which means that they can't detect smell, or excuse me, taste. So if you can't smell stuff, you typically can't taste things very well. And your patients who have anosmia, um, one of the biggest problems for you is that they don't like to eat. And we see this a lot, especially with geriatric patients, because the older we get, the worse our sense of smell is. And a lot of your geriatric patients don't enjoy eating anymore. They don't want to eat things. So one of the things that you may be able to do for them is spice up their food. Because in the mouth, we actually have pain receptors that behave like taste receptors. These pain receptors interact with some of the chemicals in spicy foods and send information to the brain, but the brain, instead of interpreting as, it as pain, actually interprets it as a taste. So when you put hot sauce on your food or you spice it up with certain things, you're actually creating pain, but you don't realize it because your brain says, oh, that must be some kind of taste. So if your patients who have this agesia uh, and they can't detect taste, if you can put spicy foods in front of them, they'll probably eat it. I mean, as long as their stomachs can handle it, they can probably eat food a lot better if you spice it up. Now, there's also something called uncinate fits. And uncinate fits usually happen when someone has had brain damage. And this is hallucinations of smell. So um, I had a friend when I was in medical school, he was in a really bad motorcycle accident. And he was riding a motorcycle, he had his helmet on and everything, and he was going around to pass a truck and somebody cut him off and he lost control and ended up flying off of his motorcycle. Super bad luck, his helmet strap broke at the same time, his helmet goes flying off his head, and he lands off with his temporal lobe on the ball hitch of a truck, which drags him for about uh, two to three miles before they figure out this guy is on the back of their truck. Now luckily for him, he was very close to Loma Linda, so they airlifted him there. They ended up having to take massive parts of his temporal lobe out, and uh, he survived. He had a lot of defects after that, but he survived. 
eventually he was able to walk again and talk again, but one of the things that really was a problem for him were unsinate fits. And when you have hallucinations of smell, they're never positive, they're always negative. So for instance, I remember one day he's talking to one of our professors, and I'm just sort of standing over on the side waiting for him to get done, and I notice he's looking really funny. It's like starting to turn kind of green, and all of a sudden he just ran out the door, and he's outside throwing up all over the place. I was like, what is wrong with you? He goes, oh my gosh, that professor's breath just started to stink so bad. It smelled like a trash can full of dead fish, and I, I couldn't stand it anymore, and he had to run out and throw up. But Professor Breath did not smell like that. He was having a hallucination. Or one time we invited him over to my house uh, on Thanksgiving, and he walks in the door, and, you know, the turkey's baking, and it smells really good in there, and he gets super angry, and he starts yelling, I can't believe you had me drive all the way up here, and you couldn't have the decency to clean the dog crap up in your house. This is ridiculous. I'm not even coming in. I'm like, there's no dog crap in the house. That's the turkey you're smelling. He thought the turkey smelled like dog crap. It's like, okay, no. And it's not dog crap, it's just the turkey. Uh, we had to go out to eat that day because he just he couldn't handle it. Now usually for your patients who have these unsinate fits, you're going to give them barbiturates to help to calm down the brain and slow down these hallucinations of smell. And eventually he was able to get those and didn't have as many fits as he had before. So that was a good thing. Now, in lab today, if I can find what I did with my lab. Do you have your taste and smell lab? Yeah, if you don't mind, I don't know what I just did with mine. I know I have it somewhere. Okay, so in the first one, the effects of saliva on taste, this is the one where you're going to dry out your mouth and use the sugar and time how long it takes for you to taste the sugar. In the second one, distribution of taste buds, this is where you're going to use beakers one through four and paint your tongue to find out where your personal taste buds are located. In the next one, effects of temperature on taste. We have some ice over there and you can put some ice onto your tongue and what I want you to do is ice it really good. And then put some sugar on your tongue. And the idea is to see, does the ice increase the taste of the sugar, make it super more flavorful, or does it take away from the taste? Uh, sometimes icing certain foods make them more flavorful. So for instance, uh, to eat hot sauce, it's better to eat it cold than hot because you get more flavor from it if it's cold. So does that do the same thing with sugar? The next one is effects of smell, taste, and texture. We talked about that. That'll be the different types of foods that you're going to uh, cut up. And then at the bottom, you're going to fill in that chart. On the next page, it's olfactory adaptation. All right, so now, for this one, we have three different oils. We have peppermint, wintergreen, and clove. Uh, I probably recommend peppermint for this one, uh, but it's up to you. You're going to take a uh, cotton ball and put some of the oil on a cotton ball, and then you're going to close off one nostril and put the cotton ball underneath your nose and just keep smelling it. And you're going to smell it and time how long does it take before you don't smell it anymore. How long does it take before your olfactory neurons adapt? Yeah. I have a question. You know how in like perfume stores they have the coffee beans? Yes. What is it with the coffee beans that eliminate that? Okay, yeah. so if I'm smelling certain perfumes, my brain adapts. It turns off. Okay. If I give my brain a different smell to smell, it'll turn back on again and then I can smell something else. So typically coffee so, beans have been used so, in the perfume world for so years. So it's something inside the coffee beans. Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Not that it couldn't be, but I'm not aware of it. So, all right. So then, now, once you're done, once you hold this under your nose and you've adapted, what I want you to do is release that nostril, close the other one, and smell. K 
can you smell it now? Does each nostril adapt separately or do they adapt together? Okay. Like for instance, uh, with a bloodhound, bloodhounds do not have olfactory adaptation. They never adapt to smell ever, which is a good thing because imagine, you know, the dog is looking for a missing child and they're smelling the child's smell and they get like halfway down the trail and go, oops, I can't smell her anymore because uh, I've just adapted to the smell. That would really suck. You could not use those dogs. And then the other thing about those dogs, which is interesting, is that they can smell things separately from different directions out each nostril. So you can watch the dog actually picking up smells from this side versus smells from this side because their nostrils work separately. So do your nostrils work separately too? All right, so the next one is olfactory stimulation. Okay, so this is like my favorite one. So you can still use that cotton ball you were using before, but then you're going to get an applicator and some lemon juice. You're going to put your applicator in the lemon juice, and then while you're smelling the cotton ball, you're going to put lemon juice on your tongue. And the question is, what do you taste? Do you taste the peppermint you're smelling, or do you taste the lemon juice that's actually on your tongue? It was a very interesting little experiment. All right, so then the last one, which is not on here, uh, we have six different smells in these test tubes. So you're going to open these up, and you're going to try to figure out what the smells are. Now, just because this is a white powder does not mean that you get this test tube and go, okay, that's not how you do it, all right? So how do you do the smell? A waft. You waft it up to your nose, okay? I know I can do that because I know that this is safe, okay? It's not the kind of white powder you might think. If it is, I'm going to feel real good soon, okay? So you're going to waft it up to your nose and you're going to try to figure out and write on your sheet what the six different smells are. And in a little while, I'll write down what all the smells are so that you know. Okay? So that's everything that we are doing today. So get going. One person per table. Go back and get your tray, please.